Um, if you have a single family home, you will be working with a FIAS uh, rater. If you have a multifamily project, you are working with a rater verifier. So just to let you know. What type of energy modeling is used in FIAS Plus certification? WFI, PHPP, REMRATE, ASHRAE, it depends. Who needs modeling? All right, WFI. All right, PHPP? REMRATE? It depends. Who needs modeling? Um, D, or it depends. Um, <laughs> again, so um, currently uh, uh, you will, on any of your passive house projects, need a Woofie model. Woofie passive. Woofie passive. And, and I'm new to the CPHC world, so I will um, defer to CPHCs in the room if I am mistaken in any of this. PHPP was the Passive House Planning Package um, that was one of the former um, uh, modeling tools that has been replaced with WIPI Passive. <clears throat> REMRATE is the low-rise modeling uh, tool that you can get. This generates a HER score, so if it's um, a single-family home or a project, three stories, actually five stories unless um, you can do, it. you'll need both WFI passive as well as REMRATE because you're going to be certified in those various certifications and those certifications require an energy model. Um, if it's a larger building, you'd be doing 90.1 in addition to WFI and yes, you do need modeling. Mm -hmm. All right, um, FIAS Plus certification only requires whole building blower door testing. True or false? True? False. <laughs> Blower door testing is life. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, false. So uh, it also depends on the type of uh, project you have. Single family. Um, so the passive house certification is built upon a number of different programs which have uh, performance testing that's involved with it. The, I think the, the thing that we see the most of is those project team members who don't know as much about the Passive House program hear about the stringent whole building blower door testing and only think that's it. Um, and they'll say, we'd like to hire you for the whole building blower door test. And I say, well, what about the rest of the certification? Oh yeah, that, that too. Um, so. There's other uh, testing that is required. If you're doing residential, uh, multifamily, you have to do compartmentalization testing, which is unit, uh, the residential unit testing in addition to the whole building lower door. They have different thresholds. Uh, we also have um, duct testing, domestic hot water, static pressure, uh, ventilation, a whole slew of it. So when you're in it, you're in it. Um, it's comprehensive and really get to know your rater and verifiers that um, they can help guide you through the whole process. So, so to, to, to start us off on our, our first question about how many certifications um, are required in Passive House. Uh, right now, the majority of Passive Houses or Passive House projects in our area are residential. Um, we have uh, one commercial project that I know of, um, more building, and then we've got a number of different project styles throughout the US. So for the residential projects, um, it all builds on Energy Star. Um, Energy Star is uh, a performance, it's now a performance-based program um, that has various checklists. Um, we are doing modeling, there's a target model, and um, we have checklists for the rater, for the builder, for the HVAC contractor, um, for the designer, and there's also mandatory program um, certifications that the builder, the rater, and the HVAC professional um, has to get. For the HVAC professional, it depends on which type of mechanical system they're using. So 
the certification that they get is called H. Quido. Um, and uh, talk to your rater uh, or verifier to get a better understanding of which certification is needed. Zero Energy Ready Homes um, is built off of Energy Star, um, and it also it requires the performance testing, it requires the modeling, um, and there's also a domestic hot water efficiency requirement uh, indoor Air Plus is required in this program, and you need to be uh, pretty much solar ready depending on what your climate is. And then Indoor Air Plus is kind of, um, this is a complementary program to Energy Star and one of the requirements of Zero Energy Ready Homes. Um, you, <coughs> you will see in the Passive House Workbook, um, and in the Energy Star checklists that there are similar categories and um, similar durability categories, so it builds off of that. Um, one of the things that, that we see in this program um, that isn't included in the other checklist is the materials, the low emissions, um, and, and that's something that you need to pay attention to. It's not as broad, it's, it doesn't have as broad of a scope as LEED certification does, but you do need to have it, um, the low VOCs for your composite woods, for your paints and finishes, and for um, your carpet adhesives uh, and padding. Is that the cabinetry? Yes. So no added about the high boxes and stuff? Yeah. Um, indoor Air Plus, so Energy Star is your energy ready, and Indoor Air Plus. Um, I'll have uh, free, uh, you can get all of the information online, so just uh, go to your favorite search engine and type it in and you can get the checklists. Um, Energy Star recently uh, released their latest version, so it's version 3.1, revision 9. Indoor Air Plus is up there, Zero Energy Ready Homes, that used to be the old Challenge Home program, if you are familiar with that. and. Indoor Air Plus also has a spec guide that you can use. Um, I think that is something for, as a rater, that's extremely helpful because we're really looking to see basically that, you know, they have, your products have the labels that are in the Indoor Air Plus program. So make it easy on yourself, make it easy on the rater, um, and you've vetted the, the specs that have come in, send that over to us. And, and that's a breeze. But don't wait till the end, and don't wait till the end. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, testing and balancing is required for Passive House certification. It's required for both space conditioning, so your heating and cool cooling, and your ventilation. Um, so, so now some of the kind of lesson learned um, and again, if you have any questions or any comments or stories of your own, please, please chime in. Um, so one of the things in talking with some of our project teams um, uh, for the in installers, um, not all installers uh, do testing and balancing. Um, so you, you might think that they would install it and would want to make sure that their systems are running correctly and into the design flows, but that is often not the case, especially so in single family. So something to keep in mind and to put in your scopes. Um, what we have to do as a rater um, is we need to make sure there, uh, FIAS has a, a very specific criteria for what the, the balancing thresholds are, um, especially for the ventilation. The supply and exhaust have to be within 10% of each other. Um, they have to meet the design flow. There's all these specific um, requirements that they need to adhere to. Uh, we have to get the wattage for it. So um, hand this off, hand the, the requirements off to your contractor. Make sure that they're very aware of what they have to do. And then also get your rater or verifier to be there at the time of the testing. Um, we learned this kind of the hard way uh, in one of our projects um, to, to one of, to point number three is that different equipment, different testing equipment 
yields different results. So what FIUS requires is that um, the rater comes and confirms what the flow rates are. Well, you can have your balancing contractor go with their equipment, and we can come in with our equipment, both calibrated, both say that they can measure this flow rate, and we would get different results. FIAS does not specify what equipment you should use. They're not trying to control the market. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, was frustrating also for us as, as the verifier because um, we want these projects to go smoothly for our clients. Um, and the project teams in this uh, was a big issue. So, um, so what can happen, or I think what the, the best way to do it and what FIAS has also recommended is to have your verifier or rater come in like at the tail end, they can do 10% of spot verification. They'll have a bolometer, a flow meter, or whatever they're using. You look up, you see the CFM, that's what's in the tab report, done. Um, so that makes the verification on the checklist that much easier. Same thing with your heating and cooling. So it's just getting that, that in um, and coordinating that is, is crucial. Um, and then also make sure that uh, the contractor you're using is using equipment that is um, rated to measure uh, the low flow rate specifically for ERVs. Uh, some of the equipment out there, even though it will read down to, let's say, 20 CFM, it might not be rated for anything under 100 CFM. So those numbers that they're getting are invalid. Um, make sure that they have calibrated equipment. So just something to keep in mind, it helps our job as verifiers um, make everything it's, it's helpful. Um, sorry. All hands on deck. Um, this is uh, just kind of general uh, for any of our green building certifications, but specifically with this, um, making sure that your contractors your subcontractors, whatever language needs to be spoken, that everybody understands what the requirements are of this project. Um, what they do, it's the, the building works as a system, what they do affects how other, other trades will perform. <clears throat> and it especially affects uh, the blower door testing um, and, and, and sometimes the, the, the ventilation and HVAC. So just making sure that everyone knows exactly what's up, um, giving them resources and guidance as early as possible, giving them the spec sheets, giving them the requirements, having going over all of these checklists, it's their eyes will roll over. Um, they, they don't see the reason of, of, of the need to be there. Um, but all of a sudden you start having a conversation about, oh, okay, so how are we logistically going to do that? Um, I, I, you know, we didn't spec that in our plans for this. So it just starts to generate those conversations that you need to have and work out at the front end. Um, Mid-construction testing, make sure that they come and do it. Make sure that they're there doing blower door testing. I mean, we're there, it's, it's a requirement for us to be there for framing, insulation. Make sure that they do some pre-testing for you so that if there are issues, you can address them at an appropriate time and not at final testing and say, oh, snap. Um, so, um, and even, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure that the people that you are working with are very experienced and some have been in the trades for a very long time and that's not to discredit their work, but doing the diagnostic testing if they haven't done a blower door, if they haven't done a duct test before, if they haven't used any of these tools before, just substantiates their work and allows them to see um, a little bit clearer uh, how they're doing and not just prescriptively that, yes, we put that in the designs, yes, they sealed this up, um, test it, just get it done. Um, also, uh, last point on there, Please do not schedule your tests um, for the last day prior to occupancy. Um, please do not do that. Uh, 
um, things will happen even if you've done mid construction testing. Um, allow a little bit of extra time. Allow, it, you, we'll go in for an insulation inspection mm -hmm. and have the drywall installers nipping at our heels. And if it's not done correctly, I'm not going to look it over and say, okay, yep, I know that you're in a schedule. Um, I will make you fix it. And you will get frustrated, but we just all have to be on the same page to make sure that this building is going to perform as it's supposed to. So build that extra time in. Um, communicate. Do it again, and again, and again. Um, and this is something that, that I feel that we as a rating firm have learned, um, and probably what you learn um, as well, you uh, specialize in whatever your expertise is. And you communicate with some of the jargon and the acronyms, and we have our, our charrette to use a lead term. We have our meeting and follow up and say, hey, just checking in on this. You know, hey, just checking in on this. Um, but they're in the midst of so many other things, and this is a new process for them. So just, just to reiterate, get to know your teams a little bit better, see how they want to, to um, be communicated with, um, because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and when it doesn't work, it's, it's really, really frustrating and can affect the relationship that you have. So, so these are some of uh, the majority of inspections that we do when we're here for mid-construction. We have a framing inspection. We review the insulation, the interior. We grade them according to ResNet. Um, we, we ask for project teams. This is an involved process. So um, if you're a part of the team, we're not gonna be there for every single moment. So take as many pictures as possible. Um, we have to relay so there's, there's so many different layers of QA and communication. Um, so the more information that FIAS has and, and that we have to give them, the better and the faster it'll be for you to get certified. So during mid-construction, um, so these photos are uh, from some duct testing. Um, up here we used a fog machine. Uh, so yes, you have been been doing it and doing it correctly and you sealed everything, but you still missed these gaps. Um, blower door testing using the smoke machine or the little smoke stick. We have a lot of fun tools. Um, uh, and it's going in some of the electrical boxes. So there's, there's certain places that are, are pretty problematic, um, but these are all of the elements that we do during the construction. And for the kind of the, the scope of testing, it's not just whole building blower door. It's it's the building. It's units. It's domestic hot water, um, ERV. Uh, there's a lot of photo verification and measurements taken, ventilation, space conditioning, all of it. So um, also just in scheduling the time, it's going to take a little while. So um, you're going to have conversations. The whole building blower door is not going to be one test or half an hour. Um, it is done in pressurization and depressurization mode. Um, uh, it's a multi-point test, so um, so it takes a little while. Um, the equipment has to God bless you. The equipment has to be turned around, um, or the fan has to be turned around. So so there's some logistical things that happen as well. And if we don't have cooperation and coordination with the entire project team, um, specifically the mechanical contractors when it comes to uh, the whole building blower door testing to make sure that the building is set up correctly, um, that, that can be a hindrance. And then these are some of the lessons learned um, during our, our final testing. Um, for duct testing, uh, Make sure that um, your installation contractors oftentimes will test the ducts and then when they put air handlers in, they don't seal the air handler as well. And there's so much leakage going on there and you have to hit a performance threshold for total leakage and leakage to outside. So make sure that they get that done. Make sure that they know what, 
what the performance test uh, is. Um, some of them haven't heard of a duck test or a duck blaster before. They don't know what threshold they have to hit. Um, so putting that maybe in your contracts, <laughs> that, that there's some responsibility um, for how they install it. Uh, bedroom pressures, so uh, FIAS also requires um, that the pressure in the bedrooms when the space conditioning is on um, is at a maximum of three pascals or five pascals depending on the design flow. Um, basically what it's trying to ensure is that um, the supply air doesn't get uh, stuck in rooms when the doors are closed. So you need to have proper undercut, you need to have returns, um, you need to have jump ducts. Those are some of the, the strategies that you can use, Mark. Transfer girls, so I'm checking this application. Transfer girls, yep. Um, one of the hard things about about this particular test for us is that oftentimes we uh, we can't do this until final testing. Um, so it's hard for us to provide you with some insight early on. Um, and the, the DOE has a good website, um, the, the Building America web, website, that has a ton of information and they've got instruction on how to do this. But there's, there's not a, a guarantee of if you do this, you will 100% pass. And this is, for that test in particular, that's why it's so important that you right size your mechanical systems. In Passive House, it's not as much of a problem, but in some of the other programs it is, especially when you've got small units um, and a, a super small load. Um, it's, you know, and, and that's something that Passive House is working on and, and the, um, uh, the industry is, is evolving, so. Um, uh, ventilation, uh, that, that's been just kind of a tricky thing for us. Um, uh, one of our projects, uh, we went in for final testing and the insulation on the ductwork was installed incorrectly, uh, which doesn't s sound like a huge issue, but when you have the incoming air um, in the ductwork not insulated, uh, that it's a requirement by FIAS, so that had to be changed. Another project that we went to, um, I was I was going to test the exhaust um, flow, and there was air blowing straight on my face, um, and the con or the builder said, "No, you're <laughs> you're wrong." I'm like, "Oh no no, <laughs> come on over here, take a look at this." So that that was a problem, um, and and so that's. That's all trusting your contractor, just knowing that if mistakes happen, that they're gonna come back and fix them. Um, uh, that particular project too had, um, we had some issues with the ventilation uh, balancing, so using the right equipment. Um, yeah. And then the red door of truth, um, the blower door test. So, we can do blower door testing uh, in a variety of different applications, uh, depending on the volume and the size and the amount of air that we need to have or we need to move. Um, we've got a, a three panel fan or a three fan panel, two, one, and then <clears throat> up at the top here um, is uh, a duct blaster that was used for a single family home. So. Um, because the thresholds for Passive House are so tight for the blower door testing, um, you can get away with using just a duct blaster. Um, the issues that we found specifically with Passive House projects uh, were um, gaps around windows, the window spacers, the framing, uh, the super high performance European windows are awesome if they work correctly. Um, and if there aren't any uh, bends or um, everything is level, uh, it's, it, <laughs> it's an intentional break in the envelope. Um, and so that can sometimes, no worries, you know, it's our, it's our windows. These are, these are super tight insulated windows, um, but you can still have some leakage problems. You say at the installation or the window unit itself? Um, the window unit itself, 
and then we also had like this the space uh, for one project we were there during mid construction and the spacers for the Zolo windows um, there were little gaps everywhere. You mean the shim space? The shims, yep. Okay, yeah. yeah, you got to deal with that. Right. Yep. Um, uh, <laughs> are an issue. Uh, that's one of the things that, as a raider, um, in working through, it's kind of difficult because it's a it's a touchy area and not being able to to really mess around or touch the sprinklers with the local fire department. So um, there are different applications that you can use. But um, that that can have an impact on the blow door test. Um, for the whole building testing, the shutting down of the common systems, that's where make sure that you have the HVAC contractor on site um, during your whole building testing. Make sure that you have total control of that building and that the other contractors um, either have extremely, extremely minimal um, uh, work going on or you're there at the end of the day. Um, the reason why is because shutting doors can affect the blower door test. Um, going in, in interior doors, going out exterior doors, of course. Um, turning on, like going into a bathroom and turning on an exhaust fan. Um, all of these things that just seem minimal can have an impact on the test. Um, also making sure that uh, that the mechanicals, the centralized mechanicals are sealed up correctly. Um, you can tape off uh, continuously running systems that do not have dampers. The other ones, um, systems that have dampers uh, need to stay in place and you can't um, uh, add additional taping to that. So um, wind can affect the blower door test. Uh, that was an issue with one of our projects. We had to, um, and we ended up moving the location of our blower door because we were getting such high wind fluctuations and our equipment was shutting. We have a, um, a blower door that calculates all the multi points called tactite. Tactite kept shutting down because the wind fluctuations were so high. And also, um, as I mentioned before, the testing is done in depressurization and pressurization, and um, the, the results are averaged. Um, when it's done in pressurization, you have a higher chance of blowing open dampers, um, whereas when you're depressurizing, you're sucking the dampers or closing it more. So um, that's been problematic. And uh, VTAC units, uh, for the last one, I, I would highly recommend um, discussing the strategy for installation of VTAC units. Um, all the projects that we've been on um, with VTACs have had issues with lower door testing. What is it? Vertical. Um, Vertical testing. Yeah. Oh, like a so like a packaged um, through the wall. Through the wall. Okay. Yep. Yeah. PTAC. PTAC. PTACs. Yeah. And the last one that was kind of funny, um, this was one of our projects that we went to uh, in Hinsdale and we had a blower door party for Theus and the cops showed up. <laughs> We're just doing blower doors, sir. Just doing blower doors. So, anyway, um, that's it. So, we can, yeah, Curtis. Okay, so I'm trying to understand where the verifier fits into a passive house project. You have the design team, the owner team, and the construction team. Uh, where in that tripartite relationship does the theist verifier fit in? Um, so <clears throat> on, a, on a passive house project, you have, you're required to have a CPHC. Um, you are required to have a a rater or a verifier. So the depending on if it's a single family or multi-family project, the rater or verifier is the one who goes through, there's a, a compliance checklist that FIAS has. They're the ones that are saying, yes, this project was built according to specs. 
Um, everything that's in the WUFI model, um, this is what has been installed. All of the performance, it's, uh, we are adhering and um, uh, getting passing results for the requirements of Passive House. Um, so we are the ones that are actually doing all of the the field verification. We are, we are the boots on the ground um, that are ensuring that this building or home um, is done correctly. If there is an error, for example, like the, the non-insulated ductwork, mm -hmm. do you issue the directive to the subcontractor or, or do you report that to the owner to handle it with the subcontractor? I report it to whomever my client is. Um, I will, I will, we relay it to, like, typically we're there with the site super foreman. Um, we will let them know that there is an issue, this is what we see, and then we send a follow-up report saying this was done incorrectly, and then whomever on their team is responsible for fixing it. And then we have to come back. Okay. I'm just wondering how that conflict uh, is managed, but, okay. It's fun. <laughs> So who usually is your client? Um, developers, architects, um, homeowners, builders. Usually not builders. Uh, developer builders. getting us involved or getting your reader verifier involved at the earliest point possible. Um, and then when you are discussing uh, in those early projects, even maybe before you hire them, um, to say we will need to be here this this many times. And so the, the, no, I, I understand yeah. that, but for so much, so much project work, mm -hmm. you know, you, there is a way to sort of have a shortcut and say, okay, I know that this is going to be this, so I'm building the budget. So mm -hmm. if I'm a developer, So, okay, I'm an architect at CPHC, and we've done the first handful of passive houses in the Chicago area, which when you do the first one, you're like, all right, I did the first one, and then you get to this point where you come back and tell everybody about the things that you didn't know. So I feel like it's my responsibility to the community here to kind of let you know things to look out for. Now, these are homes, um, small scale. There can be different lessons on you know, larger institutional projects. We're doing our first institutional project right now. It's out for bid. It's a park district building that we're retrofitting. Uh, it's a park district building that was John Van Bergen, who worked for Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, did this thing in the early 1900s, then it was added on to in the 40s, then it was added on to in the 70s, and then we're gonna add on to it. And we're gonna make that thing airtight. So um, that will be more than 7% more than, than uh, just fixing it. Okay, so, um, so here's a little uh, bit of past work. The, the house at Twilight there, 2012, that was our first passive house. It was also our first ICF house. And so doing all these firsts, I've learned, uh, is just, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to take some long, long way. That one actually went quite well. Um, there's a little bit uh, mechanical I want to talk about on that. Uh, the next passive house we did is the one on the upper uh, right, the, we call it the right size passive house. We're going to talk about that in detail tonight. First we went for lead, uh, it's a lead platinum house. We, we rolled passive house in because the metrics changed from the PHI metrics to when FIAS first adopted their revised uh, climate specific standard. Um, the bottom houses, uh, the, so there's a, a net zero project lower left, so that's not, we did not pursue passive house on that. The middle one with the interiors is in pre-certification, we have to wrap that one up. There's just a little plumbing pickup 
And then uh, the one on the lower left is a, a lower right, sorry, is a not going to pass it. It's also lead, uh, but, but hitting net zero, and that's down in Springfield. And that's one of the reasons we didn't do pass it pass, because the builder said, I'm not going to go out and tell you that I can make the air tickets. I just, I just don't know how I can get my guys to do it. So that's something to think about. Um, so uh, first, just a quick, quick recap on uh, the big the big reasons why, right? So this little graph on the top is something I was doing with uh, with Garrett, who is my absolute genius energy modeling guy in the office. Um, we were just looking at a, a thousand square foot prototype, 25 by 40, how much energy does it use, and then how much energy would it use if you put an element right next to it, so they're sharing a wall. And then if you made it a four flat, then you made it a six flat. And so that's what's going on with the, with the diminishing um, heating and cooling demand here from a pretty much passive house down to there. It's cutting that heating and cooling demand almost in half. Well, sorry, heating demand. The more you insulate it, actually, it takes more energy to cool. So that's another lesson learned about passive. We'll get there. Um, but then I said, well, hey, here, migrate that back to a built-to-code house. Let's see how much more heating and cooling energy that takes. Boom. Three and a half more times energy to heat and cool that. So when you look at the overall energy use, the red is the heating and cooling. You know, plug loads aren't going to change that much between a really well-insulated house and uh, a not so well-insulated house. Domestic hot water isn't going to change that much. So it really gets into, um, you know, the heating and cooling in our climate is the big deal. So that's why we do it. Um, I like to tell people that it's treating the thermal envelope with the same level of craftsmanship that you would the stair for the interior finished carpet. You just got to care about everything. Um, so the space conditioning is definitely our biggest opportunity for massive savings in energy. Um, it leads to more resilience. I had owners shut off their mini split when it got to 20 below just to see what happened. And they woke up in the morning, the house was down to 60, uh, 64 degrees in 20 below weather. And in uh, about a half an hour, it was back up to 70. The sun came out and everything was fine. So. It's, so it's good for that. No, no burst pipes in our bathroom house. Um, the air quality is great in these houses. You have these continuous, filtered, tested and balanced systems um, that are getting the air where they're supposed to go. Um, so it, it's, it's, your, it's your, your best way to go towards net zero. Um, and especially with the way FIAS has adopted the standard, they're, they're basically adapting the standard like a code cycle. They keep studying via model buildings of different scales to figure out just what the metrics should be so that they're cost effective and climate specific. Um, you know, Anchorage, Alaska is gonna have a different kind of passive house than Miami, Florida, right? It just, you can't think about it the same way. So it's really brilliant what they're doing. The 2018 update is great. So how do we do it? Um, well, yes, it's a lot of insulation, but it's a lot of insulation put on in the right way. It's continuous. It's a thermal break. So on the, the, the left-hand side is sort of a built-to-code diagram. On the right-hand side is a passive diagram. Um, and in the old model, you know, we threw this stuff together. Back when my house was built in 1919, there was no such thing as a, a Tescon air barrier membrane, you know, or even loose fill insulation for that matter, aside from maybe some perlite or a little bit of newspaper. Um, so, so these were leaky, drafty houses. They tried their best with wire blocking to try to make them not when they were building well. Um, but they were leaky, drafty buildings. And what happens is when you heat them, you're driving all this heat through the walls and the roof, and you're keeping them nice and dry. So you don't have any condensation problems until you start insulating. So this is, uh, this is something we're going to talk about. Um, they weren't ventilated, really. And when you put in a bath van, you're not really ventilating. You're not supplying fresh air where it should go. So that's a real big change um, when you look at the diagram with the, just sort of the random leaks and maybe a bath fan going through the wall and a kitchen fan going through the wall, which means every time you turn them on, they're sucking in air through your dirty basement where there's mold and, you know, whatever. Um, and then where is that fresh air getting? It's maybe getting to your bedroom, but maybe it's not. Maybe the kitchen exhaust is getting to your bedroom and you're sleeping with carbon monoxide and you don't know it. So, um, so anyway, the, the, the control, it's about controlling the air, controlling the air in the envelope, and then controlling it inside the house or the building with the mechanical system. 
Um, and this is where it really hit me when we started having issues with heating, cooling, and comfort, that maxim that all the building science teachers will tell you that building's a system, right? Building is a system. It's just like an animal is a system, right? So how does a, a polar bear or a killer whale keep warm? They've got a, they got a way to do it. It's different from the Inuit. But they figure out the system. When you start to tweak some aspect of that system, like, you know, give the polar bear a haircut, you're going to have some problems with balancing and, and how, the, how that system works. So the leaky, drafty house with a lot of air moving through and a lot of heat being blown in at it all the time works totally different from an airtight house with big windows on the south. So, like, one of the things we learned right away was, okay, we put all that south glazing, passive solar style, and um, it's great in the wintertime, except if the house is up to temperature and you get a great big blast of sun and you have the bedroom door closed, that bedroom's really going to warm up. So it can sort of, it holds on to the energy. Sometimes that works great, sometimes it doesn't work great. If you don't shade well in the shoulder seasons, especially if it's tweaking, like May 1st or April 15th, tax day. Um, maybe, if the building, if the government's still with us. Um, and you don't have your shading really hit your southern glass that much. And it happens to be a freak warm day, which we're going to have tons of. And you get lots of solar gain, and all of a sudden they're like, dang it, my, my mini split's still in heating mode. And it's really hot in here. Well, in April, you could probably open the windows and it would be OK. Um, but you, you don't want to be flipping back and forth between heating and cooling. So really, there's something about holding on to the energy that is different about the way these animals work. OK, so let's get to some specifics. Oh, don't tell me I got weird transitions. All right. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Jesus. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I imported a slide from a. Let me, let me figure out how to do this. Uh, it's, does anybody know really well transitions? Um, I'm sorry about this. You say none. None. Thank you. But do I need to select all slides? We'll find out. We'll find out. It's universal. Thank you. Um, okay. Press control A. Just to select them all here, I'll just I'll do it again. Okay. Yeah. Control A on the slide. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Now uh, everything disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the bar. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. I'm hoping my voice held up. Okay. Here we go. So, um, all right. So here's this house. We did. Um, you can see on the lower right. Um, the, uh, the sort of assembly of our values, um, we were still, uh, how much is this place? I didn't just advance, really. So, so that's not transitions. That's not transitions. <coughs> One second, bear with me. Uh, what is the duration? duration? Leave it there. It's the duration on the right. Yeah. Duration. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. okay, thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll just leave it here, too. Um, all right, so. So we have these R50-ish walls with 2 by 8 studs, uh, 4 inch polyester on the outside. Um, we had uh, 6 inches of um, EPS insulation underneath the slabs. It's a slab on great house. A um, bunch of insulation in the TGI roofs, uh, roof structure, and uh, we hit all the targets. It's about 1,700 um, ICFA is the uh, interior condition floor area that used to be called yeah, TFA, thank you. Treated floor area. Um, and so, so look at this, right? And you take that 1724 ICFA and you multiply it times your heating load, which is your BTU hour per square foot, and um, you get a number of about 8750 BTU hour that this thing needs at peak load, okay? So theoretically, we should be able to put in a 9000 BTU hour Mitsubishi mini split would be fine. Except we know that the capacity drops when it gets really cold. So maybe we should be safe and put in a 12 kBTU system, which is what we did. Now, one of the things that was bandied about in training is that you don't really get temperature stratification in passive houses. 
And part of the reason is that the, the insulation is so complete and thorough all the way around. You don't have these cold spots, you know? And it's airtight, so you don't have the draft going, right? Well, that's not true. <laughs> because physics. Um, warm air rises, right? So in a, in a section like this, just because you got a lot of insulation doesn't mean that warm air won't rise. It's not a stack effect, it's stratification. And so what happens when warm air rises, what does cool air do? It falls. And where does it fall? To a concrete slab. Concrete slab is a really nice thermal mass. And my hypothesis about this, and if anybody's got any ideas, throw them out, is it's like a flywheel. So as, as the winter goes on, um, the cooler it keeps falling, it keeps charging that slab, making it colder and colder. And so it, it wants to just hold on to that. It takes a lot of beat to use to warm up a big chunk of concrete. So, did I just, right? Did I just back it up? I did. Does it do, am I okay without the mic? No, we need it. The video needs it. We need it. They need it. Okay, well, um, is it working now? No. Dead battery, it says. <laughs> I'll stand over here. Is there, is there a video on that? Is there a sound on that? I'll just stand here. Yeah, we've got a Mike directional mic. Like, okay. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, this is this is uh, one of the things we started noticing. We got temperature stratification. In the summertime, it's getting really hot up there. And what we did with the um, what we did with the mechanical system is this. So, um, the blue is the ventilation, and the red is the space conditioning. So they're totally separate. We have a Zender 350 ERB that's doing all of our um, air quality, basically. It's, it's, it's our ventilation. So we have typical passive house diagram where exhaust is coming out of laundry, bath, kitchen. So laundry, so this pointing towards the circle is exhaust. Pointing out of the circle is supply. All the betters are getting fresh air. So your, your CO2 level is low. You wake up feeling good. You live in a passive house. Um, and so bathrooms, etc. The unit is up here in the laundry, in the laundry slash mechanical. Um, and so, so the ventilation system is running constantly. It's separate from condition. And one thing that we learned in the first passive house was that it's a counterflow heat exchanger. So in the winter time, it's just a little bit drying out your house and just a little bit cooling down your house when it runs. And so when you close a door, that room will keep getting, thank you, you're welcome. All right, we're good. Um, man, the tail end of this cold, and it's like settled right in my throat, so normally I'm a soprano. Um, <laughs> I can really hear it when I'm talking to so, so what's going on with the, with the ERB is working against you a little bit. And we all, I think, know that. So on the first pass of house, we swapped out the Zender for a serve conditioning ERB. What it does is it takes that, uh, the fresh air and it just puts a little heating into it in the wintertime, a little cooling into it in the summertime, so the temperatures being delivered is really comfortable. It took care of everything, just balanced everything out. The kids were closing their door and playing in there and it would just get hot in the summertime, you know, and sweat. So, so that's something that's going on. Now in this house it wasn't such a problem because it's quite small and um, the, I, I'm not sure exactly I think the other one was just spread out more and made it a little more of an issue. But the issue here is that we took our, our, our load seriously and we put one mini split on the second floor. And right when we did this, Martin Holiday came up with an article saying, hey, if you're doing a low load house, make sure you put a mini split on each level. So we talked to the owners about it and they were up against the wall on budget. And like, no, we're going with the one. So sure enough, um, you, you know, temperature stratification is a thing. So, um, Winter came and they're like, you know, the slab's pretty cool. We thought it would be a little better than this. And we're like, yeah, it should be room temperature, you know? And we take the thermal camera there and it's just not quite. It's like 64. And that's enough when you get spoiled with your passive house comfort, you know, that, uh, that you'll notice that 64 when it's 70 upstairs. And, um, and then there's another really big issue, which is that I'm told, anybody in German? Little Germany? Do people tend to sleep with their bedroom doors open more? Somebody just told me that. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Scotch? No. Vodka. Um, the 
bedroom doors are closed, and we also expect acoustic isolation. What do we use to acoustically isolate ourselves? Thermal insulation. So we're creating these little pockets that are separate from each other, and we're closing the door, and we're going, why is it not getting warm enough in my bedroom? Well, probably because you've insulated it and you shut the door, and the mechanical system is bringing cooler air in. You see, so, so the mechanical engineer just look at me and go, you idiot, just duct it to the bedroom. Well, that's what we're doing. So, I, I'm sorry, that was a, that was a spoiler. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what we had, and so we decided to fix it. And we got involved with the client, we did, went through a whole bunch of uh, ideas and iterations, and basically this is all you need to do. We just put a tiny little mini split with its own outdoor unit in the master bedroom up on the second floor, where they're all insula insulated away from the rest of the house. And we're putting one on the first floor. And it's literally going in today. I drove by the site and I saw the Mitsubishi van on the heating plate van. Um, so it's kind of a big deal, and it's kind of an embarrassment to, to retrofit, but on the other hand, um, we now have a successful house. The owners asked me, is this going to use a lot more energy? What do you think? No, it's the same amount of heating and cooling energy. And the beauty of these mini splits is that they modulate down to a really low load if you use single zone systems. If we use a single multi-zone system, if we use a multi-zone system with one outdoor unit to drive all three of those heat pumps, it would probably not be able to modulate nearly as far down and be as efficient. So Mitsubishi's dealing with this, they keep, you know, iterating. Okay, so that's, that's that guy. Um, the next passive house we did was also slab on grade, and um, basically the same thing. Uh, and here again, heating load, 4.6 BTU hour, we were, uh, yeah, 1800-ish ICFA. So about the same low, we did a 12K BTU, and this was like right on the heels of that one before they had gone through a winter. So we're just like motoring through it. Now we're gonna do like six of these passive houses before anything. And so, um, yeah, same kind of deal um, where we put the mini split at the top of the stairs, the indoor ductless unit at the top of the stairs, just thinking that we would get convection there and it would mix up the best. Um, but what we did here, you know, having an inkling that this was happening, as we said, let's use a serve instead of a zender. So let's use the conditioning ERV instead of the non-conditioning ERV. It'll give us a little bit of heating, a little bit of cooling. Well, if you really put Build Equinox, the guys who make the serve against the wall, and say, how many BTUs can I count on? They say, don't count on any. Um, <laughs> so it's, so it's, it's like, you know, maybe 3K BTU hour, maybe. So it's not enough when you split that up in your ventilation area. Remember, the ventilation area isn't moving that fast. So it's not delivering that much heating or cooling. So they don't want you to think of it as really part of your conditioning system, just a more friendly ventilation system. It's great, they have a little heat pump in the unit. Um, so so there's, another, there's another issue here, um, I'm just spilling it all, where uh, down in this, with, so there's no basement in the house. We, we want to design, so that there's a kind of a buffer area in the house for all that stuff that you want to put behind a wall that you would normally put in the basement. So, um, so we have this kind of quadrant of the house. It's in the northwest corner. Um, the the uh, heat pump water heater is there, which says MEC, and then directly above that is where the serve is. So on the second floor is where the, the ERV is. On the first floor is the the heat pump water heater. You know how the heat pump water heater works, right? It takes heat out of the air and puts it in the water. It's on the first floor, right by the slab. So it takes heat out of the air, and the cool air drops right there, and she's sitting working on a sewing project right here. And we go out with the thermal camera, and the slab's like 58 degrees. We're like, this is ridiculous. This is not working. So they do have a switch. You can shut off that indoor, that heat pump. So it just goes pure electric when it's really cold out going to kill your, your performance because it's a COP of three goes on to COP of one on that heat pump system. So that's not good. So what are we doing? Well, there's a couple of options. One is you upgrade a couple thousand more dollars for the Sandin or what's the other guy's name? The outdoor unit heat pump water here. Does anybody know? Chill tricks, but that's a different animal kind of. And so you put an outdoor unit with your other heat pump outdoor units and um, 
all that, all that stuff, it's not cooling down the house anymore. You just have an indoor storage tank that's got a little resistance backup and you've got all your heat, your hot water that way. So, um, so yeah, you gotta be careful of those indoor sources that can work against you. When you're, um, when we're looking at this house, here it wasn't really a problem because in that laundry room, um, it just, it, it just, they're, they're not there. It's not right where, in the area where they are spending their time and their feet are getting cold. So um, there's also a mini split, or sorry, a ERV exhaust there. So theoretically, it's a negatively pressurized zone. So the warm air is coming into there and it's not kind of leaking out of the rest of the house, theoretically. Am I going too fast? Is this all right? So here's our fix. One little new ductless mini split downstairs put it in a couple weeks ago, I said, how is it? And they said, took care of everything. It's great. And Jen chimed in. She says, even I'm satisfied. You know, when she's sitting there by the, you know, cold, previously cold floor. So yeah, there you go. Uh, mini split on each level, um, separate outdoor units. So what if we're not going to uh, retrofit? We're actually going to design it. Um, this is just happens to be a project we're working on, uh, modular prefab, and yeah, oh sorry, yeah. So Chris. with that last project, uh, were you using the serve that is controlled by ERB? Yeah, it's ERB. Are you using another unit? For ventilation, only the serve. The serve's great, it's a great ERB. Yeah, um, and it's ducted, so we've got Separate ducting system for that, and we have the ductless mini split from Mitsubishi doing the heating and cooling. So I've seen uh, another presentation on where the serve is about 3.5 to 3 EOP, but if you take the passive ventilator, it's going to be about 9 to 12 EOP. Uh, well, we, we, um, we use a different rating, the, the percent efficiency. So, like the Zender unit rates at like 84% efficiency for the heat recovery. There's a heat recovery, and then there's a CFM per watt, or watts per CFM for the motor. Um, and so we have to use about 75% for the serve. It's not as good as the Zender, but it's more comfortable. So it's, and, and it seems like it should be, because it's using a heat pump, which has got a COP of three in or more inside the unit to drag heat from the incoming airstream to the outgoing, you know? And so it seems like it should be really leveraging that, but uh, we've been back and forth with Fias and Bill D. Clinox, and we can't get them to get that above 75. Yeah? I guess I heard about it in the summer, not in the winter. I mean, the delta T is so much higher in the winter, but that means your heating is running more. more sensitive in cooling season than in heating season. I mean, worst case scenario, in the winter time, you overheat, you can open window. Um, worst case in the summer, you overheat and your system's not sized good enough or whatever, I mean, you're just gonna sweat. So, yeah. Okay, so on this module prefab, this is just an exam packed, uh, as part of the, the passive house ethos kind of, right? You know, don't stretch it out if you can pull it together. And um, so you can see how the plan's working. Basically, all the systems are in the north modules. We got the bathroom stacked over the kitchen, and um, the bathroom's also stacked over the mechanical uh, closet, which backs up on the half bath. So the idea is that in the in the factory, basically all the all the plumbing is in one module, pretty much. And then uh, there's just one little crossover for for uh, conditioning. Um, so here's the same plan. So here's the concept, and this applies not just this module, but basically everything at different scales, which is um, if there are gonna be rooms that are closed, just duct them. And what, when we started with this, Mitsubishi didn't have these different ducted options on the inside, so now they've got a whole slew of options. You can do the ductless kind of thing up sitting on the wall. You can do a, 
kind of a version of that that fits in the ceiling. It's just got a big grill to kind of blow it out. You can do um, a low static pressure unit if you just want to hit, let's say, a bedroom and a bathroom. You can do a medium static that'll basically take care of the whole floor of the house, or you can do a full, <coughs> excuse me, high static ducted system. Now, currently the medium static, which is 0.6, what are we measuring on static pressure? Is it inches? Water column? Good. So 0.6 is the medium static, and it's currently only available in the hyperheat, which is the efficient one we want to use, um, at higher outputs. But Mike Schaefer, Mitsubishi rep, told me by third or fourth quarter, we should be getting that in the, the 9,000, 12,000, 24,000 BTU power um, capacities as well for single zone. Um, and so what we're looking at is essentially the blue again is ventilation, and we're um, We've got an ERB down there in the mechanical room. Easy through the wall, close, not a lot of losses. Um, we're dragging the, the returns out of the kitchen, uh, mechanical, which is where the laundry is, and, and powder rooms so are just really short, you know, duct runs for exhaust. And then supply just comes up that uh, trunk wall, the wet wall, basically. And, um, well, I'm sorry, uh, on the second floor, we're just dragging up return from the master bath over in that gray area, which is the soffit, and then it comes down the wall to the ERB. Supply then is really interesting because you got two options. Well, you got three options. One is you duct it independently, completely of all the conditions. And that's the most surefire way from a testing and balancing standpoint. Every point can be tested and, and verified in its airflow. Um, it's not uncommon, though, to take the fresh air and dump it into the return side of a unit like that meant to be she low static. And so the option we're looking at here is taking the fresh air and splitting it in two. One, just dumping into the first floor, so you have fresh air downstairs. And then the rest of it dumping up into the return side of the red unit there on the second floor, which is that Mitsubishi um, blower. It's about a nine inch piece of equipment. So it sits in a one foot socket pretty easily with the access hatch on the bottom. And just ducting that into the bedrooms, and then the fresh air will come in that in that duct system. And the, they like to run on kind of low speed. The, the, the Mitsubishi does, so it's distributing that fresh air when the ERB kicks on, if it's not running continuously. And then downstairs, we just have a, a single wall-mounted one. We're trying to do the economical thing here um, in a passive house in Lake Bluff that we just started construction. We don't want we didn't want any uh, wall-mounted units that you look at. So we just did the, the low static in the uh, crawl space and in the soffit on the second floor, kind of like the traditional system. Um, we did that with a multi-zone outdoor unit. So, so that's our that's our kind of uh, our concept. Um, I just wanted to hit really quickly on what we've been looking at at wall assemblies, just as part of this. Um, we haven't had any issues with this. It's just really a question of cost and, and simplicity. Um, you know, the thermal envelope kind of it just sits there. The mechanicals are really the, the variable as I see it to really get comfort and, and uh, I shouldn't say that. They're, they're, shading is really, really important. Shading together with your solar heat gain coefficient of the glass are, are really important. So um, that upper picture is that uh, Hinsdale passive house. It's pre-certified, not finished yet. Um, and what we did there was two by sixes with five and a quarter EPS. The reason for five and a quarter is a kind of a clever detail we came up with the windows where we could put a two by 12 buck right here and it flushes out with the EPS. It gives us something to attach the framing to and run the air barrier around on, I'm sorry, attach the windows to. Um, but that's multiple trips around the house on ladders. So you, you frame up the wall, you tilt it up, and then you run your first layer of foam. Well, you, you tape it, you seal it, you test the air barrier. Then you run your first layer of foam, and then your second layer of foam, and then you come around with the WRB on that second layer of foam, and then you put on the furring strips, and then you put on the sides. So you made like these guys just you know circulating with 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 ladders. And they, they don't like it that much, or you pay for it. So when we realized we could relax the insulation a little bit, um, we were looking at the one third and two third rules that John Straub's condensation. Uh, kind of easy calculation. You've got to have at least one third of the R value of the entire wall 
outside the condensation plane. So this is an R10 with an R19 uh, cellulose. That's a material called InsoFast, which has got grooves on the back side, so this can operate as a drainage plane, and grooves on the front side, so you don't need a WRB and you don't need furring strips, you basically get the siding right up. Um, so there it is in the factory. Uh, it got shipped, this is for a module pre uh, It got shipped with the zip seams taped, then they uh, taped up the, the, the modules came together, and then Lindsay came out and did the blower door test, and we were all pleasantly surprised. Uh, and then they came back and put on the insofast siding. So that was like two trips around the house instead of four or five. Um, but we think we got even an easier way, which is if we use zip R, so that's a zip sheeting with the uh, two inches of polyiso attached to it. Um, got a bit of a different nailing pattern for shear, but that means that you've got your, um, your drainage plane ready to go, and it makes the windows so easy. You just do the fluid applied back here, or you do the, the zip tape, and then we use, like to use like a Prosoco air dam right there. That's our air seal against the window, so we just got water control and air control in one go, and then air control right there. Um, this is a jam, otherwise this would be sloping, you know, and you'd have like serious water issues otherwise, but uh, um, it's not a silly tip. So that's kind of the way we've taken the, uh, the wall assemblies um, we created this detail sheet for the builders because a lot of them haven't seen this stuff before and don't kind of know where all the materials are to go to. So we just kind of collected them all here, taking the 475 supply or conservation technology or Prosoco or Huber, whatever, just to get the information. Um, all right, last, last thing I've got here is uh, sort of the wall section, putting it together, how it meets the foundation. We've done a lot of foundations with a lot of exterior insulation in point of pain because that insulation is soft-ish. You know, I mean, you can get pretty dense EPS, but the denser it is, the more expensive it is. You don't want to get the geofoam, which you, know, you can build a highway on. But um, but then once you put it on, you got to cover it with something. You can cover it with uh, like a full three-coat stucco. It's, it's expensive and difficult for like a foot. You know, if you do it with the acrylic stucco, then you can kind of just like kick it and it'll break. Um, if you put cement board there, it'll eventually rot out, so it's a sacrificial layer, you know, so what are you going to do, right? Well, concrete's pretty good, except it's cold, and you're setting this warm framing on it. So we haven't done the therm model for this, or the Flixo model, or the Whoopi Passive, I want to tell you. Our modeling tool is getting a 3.2 update, which is going to have thermal bridging built in, so it's awesome. We don't have to go to therm anymore. Uh, but anyway, the, the issue is just here that uh, we don't want to set that framing right down on the cold concrete. So the question is, what can we use here? There's a there's a armatherm, which is a structural thermal break we could use. We might be able to use a, a piece of really high density, like quarter inch EPS, like a geofoam. Just rip it, easy to work with, easier than armatherm. I haven't given that to my structural engineer because we don't want this thing like rocking, you know, even though it's only quarter inch. Um, so anyway, we're going to model that and figure that out. Because if you do that, then it's just foam to the inside. And, you know, it's easy at that point. Uh, but we've got to make sure that this isn't getting to condensation risk here. So typically what we do is, you know, just run the foam up, spray some close cell there to sort of take care of that and transition up to that guy there. And then our exterior foam in the, in the form of the zip R can come down here. It can lap over a little bit. The more it laps over, the, the, I think the easier that gets. But We'll do some iterations in our, in our thermal model. How much of the energy foam is your actually from basically chewing the concrete layer? Yeah. That's cheaper than the surface, right? Yeah, and it's really, it's like, I forget how many PSI it is. It's really high PSI in general. So, yeah, I mean, that would be ideal, an insulation material separated. Yeah, we well, don't have to now. We've been, we've been using it. You don't have to use the furniture. It's just because it's grooved. Yeah, they've got that. So, um, all right, so that's that's that. Uh, tricky details, uh, air tightness at the top plate is always a, is always a, an issue. 
Um, you've got a funky transition to make. The red line is showing you the air control there. Um, this we um, drew out for modular prefab. This will do it a little bit differently if it's, if it's stick built. Um, so anyway, that was a lot of stuff. Uh, I think that's all I got. Any, yeah? You're using your gypsum as your air barrier for your, second, for your ceiling? With the modular, we are. Yeah. And so worked out okay so far? Yeah, it surprised us. What they do is they put a little uh, squash block here of OSB, which is the same thing, you know, 5 eighths there, and, and so this comes in. Um, you can totally do it. I mean, they're like Steve Basic, who writes for fine home building and uh, journal like construction. He's, Instagram's like mad. Um, he's doing a lot of airtight drywall. But you can't put cam lights in it and puncture it like crazy with all this stuff. Um, so we usually do the service cavity for that. Yeah, Jim. Um, this is from a couple slides back when you were talking about kind of space conditioning. Uh, uh, just kind of your differences between rooms. Have you guys found any, any mechanical systems that will look at temperatures between the rooms and simply just pull air from one room to the other? So, I mean, you got your, your, um, your mini split in the, in the kind of the common area more often than not. And then you notice this room is drifting. Um, is there anything like through the wall that would just? Yeah, actually, you're not ducting it. You're just saying, hey, the temperature between these two rooms is three degrees off. Let's. That was my first attempt on the the right size passive house. I got a little 12 by 12 through the wall, baffled, um, jump dug, or whatever you call it, transfer drill, and I put a bath fan on the other side of the house to pull that air down. And there's a calculation you can do how many BTUs will travel in the air, and so you look at how many CFM you need, you know, so you do a 150 CFM bath fan over here, you know. And it, it that didn't work. Because I wasn't taking conditioned air, I was taking the warm air from up here. I guess you could do that, but what would be the system to get that air out? Just a, I mean, you, you need well, to be, that's what I wonder if Mitsubishi had something like that. I mean, obviously, I think they're in. <laughs> I can almost hear the answer. Well, then just put another unit up. Well, yeah, but or I don't need I mean, another unit. I just need to. If you have a, if you have a common that. area that's conditioned well, because the mini split's right there, and you don't have the stratification thing, or you figure that out and put the fan in the right place. Theoretically, I mean, there's so many sensors you can activate fans with, right? So you could have a, just a Panasonic bath fan through the wall and have a, um, and have a blower there, and it turns on. In fact, uh, Gerilyn makes one. Jerilyn, how do you spell it? T J E R L U N D. They make their um, their floor to floor and room to room specifically for that. So if it's like if it's five degrees different, it'll kick on. It's not as quiet as a Panasonic bath fan. But we put those in too in that modular prefab. We did that because we didn't have the ability to hook up any line sets for the mini splits in the basement. So 